Uh, so hello, everyone. This is another episode of Fire, Breathe, and Rob. Thanks so much for listening to us. Subscribe, please. Also hit the like button. And also, if you can, hit the notification button so you can get all of our updates. We have another person on here that's a congressman this time. We know we just had Congresswoman Pratt Schroeder on the other day, but this is Congressman Inglis. And for anybody that knows, this man knows what it is as far as a conservative mind, as far as on the environment. So Congressman Inglis, first of all, it's an honor to have you on. And thanks so much for coming on. Greatly appreciate it. Good to be with you, Rob. Thanks for the opportunity. How has the Republican Party changed since you went to Congress in 1993? I think we've listened to the rabble rousers, the hotheads, the popping off people. Um, and we have geared our whole stance toward them, which uh, has resulted in a real problem um, that I think is now evident to many Republicans. Um, you know, it's, I, th I think that hothead element is, is present in every, every population. You know, every culture has this thing that goes on where somebody just pops up at the mean and say, let's do so-and-so, you know, and they're just all hot and bothered. And, and successful companies and efforts and businesses and churches and whatever know how to say, now there, you've said it. <laughs> and then let the person and go sit in the back of the room and let somebody of a calmer head figure the way forward. But my party um, sort of listened to all the hotheads and we go, we all raced after the hotheads and did whatever they were spouting off about. Uh, and the result is disaster. What do you say to these people on both sides of the aisle that are hurting in this country and they are listening to the fringes on the right and the left? Yeah, there are some people that are certainly hurting, um, and that's that's the case. Um, however, I, I know the right better than I know the left, so you'll have to tell me about the left. But uh, on the right, what I'd say is not so many of those people are really hurting economically. So, some of them are, but more they're hurting culturally. Um, they feel disrespected, disregarded, cast aside. And that's their problem. It's not that, in fact, if you go to their houses, I think you'd find them living pretty comfortably. You know, they have central air conditioning and heating and mm -hmm. hot water heaters and uh, plenty of food in the cabinet. Um, but they feel culturally disrespected. Um, they, they, and then they listened to a, a guy who told them that he was going to be their savior with skin on him. Um, well, he turns out to be a pretty pathetic savior, to tell you the truth. I mean, uh, pretty, pretty doggone pathetic. Um, and so um, and, and so now they're dealing with that disappointment. Uh, but yeah, I think it's uh, so and all, all that can normally happen in like you said earlier, in populations and cultures of all kinds. But I think you add to that this excessive consumerism we have and the idea that we go into the grocery store mm -hmm. and I can get exactly the orange juice I want. You know, some pulp, no pulp, most pulp, with calcium, without calcium, with so, you know, the, the permutations of orange juice mm -hmm. in the orange juice cabinet you know, I mean, it goes on for 30 feet in the grocery store, um, uh, all the kinds of orange juices you can have. And, and so we go get exactly what we want. And we go to Starbucks and we get exactly the kind of coffee we want. Um, and we come to politics and we think we can get that. And you can't. <laughs> because when you come to politics, you might be looking for orange juice. You're going to get some kind of a fruit drink out of the political process, but it is not gonna be with pulp, with calcium and uh, fresh squeezed or whatever. It's not because there's somebody, you gotta compromise in the political process. So you're gonna get some sort of fruit beverage um, when, you, when you go into the political store, you're not gonna get what you get at the grocery store. And so the expectation that we've set that we're gonna get exactly what we want just doesn't work that way in politics. You gotta, it's a, it's a big country and you gotta be able to, 
to give and take and say, okay, I'll get a fruit drink. Uh, it doesn't have to be exactly my kind of orange juice. The, the problem I feel like is the Democratic Party, people like Joe Biden, people like Barack Obama. Barack Obama ran on, and I'm sure you remember this, you were in Congress at the time. Barack Obama ran on universal health care. So did Hillary Clinton in 2008. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there. I'd say this. Uh, you know, here's the problem. Healthcare is the most complicated issue mm -hmm. uh, uh, to facing humankind. Reason? There's a 100% death rate and there's a lot of suffering between here and there. Mm -hmm. And the reality is there is no such thing as a perfect healthcare system. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just does not exist. I mean, it is a fallen world where we're all going to die and we've got a lot of troubles between now and that point of death. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the, that's a bleak reality of of healthcare, unlike climate change, for example, which is completely solvable. Um, and really we should be very optimistic about it. Um, uh, healthcare, it's just a real downer because uh, you, you can't solve it. Um, it's an insoluble thing. So um, what you're trying to do is just reduce suffering. And the question is how to do that. Well, um, it is a curious thing that uh, Barack Obama from a, I mean, if you, if you just look at it objectively from the right, what I think we should say from the right is, gee, he was trying to save the, uh, the private system of private insurance. Mm -hmm. it, it was the last best chance to save private insurance. That's what it is. It's designed to create a, uh, a marketplace of private insurers and um, make it work. Uh, and uh, it's a curious thing that happened that my party started calling it socialism and all that stuff um, because it was an attempt to save private health insurance. The, the person who most aggrieved, I think, by that should be Hillary Clinton because Barack Obama beat her about the head and shoulders uh, saying that he didn't want the public option and beat her on that point. Um, that's, that's really sad for Hillary. I mean, she's the one most aggrieved in that. Um, and then of course, uh, Barack Obama turned around and, and did some other things. So that's the, um, yeah. Um, so I don't know on your, your side, there's a, there's a lot of working out about that thing, but, uh, on, on, on the side of, uh, conservatives, it's, it's, here's the, here's our problem is we have free riders we have people who think that they can go uninsured and then show up and get care. Mm -hmm. And what state after state has proven is if you do that, you can't control cost. Because if I wait until I've, got, I've been diagnosed with cancer to buy insurance, well, the cost of that insurance is gonna be through the roof mm -hmm. because everybody's waiting until they get the diagnosis of cancer. It's like having a system of fire insurance for your house, where once your house is on fire, you speed dial the insurance company, and you get it insured. Well, what's that going to cost you? It's going to cost you an enormous amount because no, no, you pay insurance by and by for things you don't want to happen, your house to burn, you'd get cancer. And so um, that's, that's what you got to do on the right. The thing that we failed to do is say, yeah, you got to have a guarantee. You got to have an individual mandate. How in the world we came to oppose that is beyond me. Because what we all said during the 80s and 90s and was, of course, you got to make everybody buy health insurance. You can't have any free riders. Um, you know, if you operate a bus system, you let people get on and not pay. Well, for any, you know, sucker who pays, they can pay through the nose, right? Because everybody's getting a free ride. So no, no, you got to charge everybody. And then the bus is relatively affordable. Same thing with healthcare. So that's where we went wrong on the right. On the left, uh, I don't know, there's, uh, uh, you'll have to diagnose that about what went wrong on the left. Well, I, I want to get into environmental issues, but a qu few quick questions before that. But just to tap on what you said about things that Republicans were for and now they're against. Something that happened in the 90s, cap and trade. It's going on in California right now. That was a Republican idea. Now the Republicans run away from that. 
So, you know, that's something, like you said, you talked about the individual mandate with health care, cap and trades, the same thing, uh, which was a Republican idea. I do want to talk quickly before we get into the environmental issues, Congressman, about the Tea Party movement in 2010 in that election against Trey Gowdy. Can you discuss that? Yeah, yeah. You know, I used to run from that epithet, you know, rhino. Now I turn around and face the person throwing that at me, and I say, uh, I just ask him, how long you, uh, how long you been a Republican? I say, uh, where were you in 1980 when I was helping Tommy Hartnett win the first district of South Carolina, turn that from blue to red? Where were you in 1986 when I was helping Carol Campbell become the most effective governor in uh, South Carolina's modern history. Mm. Where were you? And I keep on going. Where are you in 92 when we, we, when we took a seat that was blue and turned it red? And I go on, coming up through the list. And then I say to them, how long have you been a Republican again? <laughs> and then, and then, and then I like to say, well, maybe it's you that's a Republican in name only. Um, you know? And so, um, yeah. Uh, what happened? Uh, well, it's like this. Uh, if you're an incumbent, 12 year incumbent, at least I was, I mean, I was there six years, out six years, came back another six, and you get put in a runoff, the chances of you winning that runoff are really slim, right? Because um, you should have won it outright. Right. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, there's just a lot of, a lot of throw the bums out kind of feeling, including our bum, you know, and so I was the, I was the bum. Um, and uh, that's, that's the way that came down in 2010. Right. It, it was sad because a lot of people that were moderate Republicans that actually had some sense and some brains uh, got thrown out during that year. I think of Mike Castle, my friends from Delaware, he speaks about Mike Castle and how he was a moderate from Delaware. And obviously now Delaware is fully Democrat. It's been like that for quite a few years now, but he was a person that I believe he was the governor of Delaware yeah. at one time. And then he yeah. went to Congress, right? So Yeah, and no, I served with Mike. And he, Mike, I think Mike would not mind you calling him a moderate because that's really probably what Mike's voting record would look like. Mm -hmm. If you look at my voting record, just to be honest with you, okay. it'd be hard to call me a moderate. <laughs> I mean, okay. 93 American conservative union wow. rating, 100% Christian coalition, 100% national okay. right to life, A with the NRA, zero with the Americans for Democratic Action, 23 by some mistake with the AFL CIO, the labor union, I was really gunning for a zero. Um, so, um, so pretty hard to call me a moderate, uh, but, 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 but if, if, it, if there's such a thing as moderate in tone though, in other words, uh, you know, I call myself a Jack Kemp Republican. Jack Kemp was, the guy, uh, it's hard to remember this a long time ago, but he was the guy that uh, uh, Bob Dole had on the ticket. Um, when he's running against Bill Clinton's re-election. And, uh, and Jack Kemp was this, what he called himself a bleeding heart conservative. And he's a very optimistic guy. Um, and so if that's what you call moderation, in other words, sort of being optimistic and hopeful and not down in the mouth and we're all done for, and uh, gee, what, what is it, American carnage? Right. Um, in the in the inaugural address four years ago, if if that's your taste, then yeah, you would define me as a moderate because no, I, I don't do that. I, I want to do American exceptionalism and optimism and hope for the future, and let's uh, let's get it going, you know, rather than let's sit around and tell how bad things are and uh, how we need a savior with skin on him. Turns out to be sort of a puny savior, but um, you know that's the. Uh, Anyway, that's so, so yeah, uh, I'm just explaining why I'm not really accurately right. cast as a moderate. Okay. Uh, Congressman Inglis here on Fire Breathing. Rob, Congressman, let's talk about this as we end your career and talk more about environmental issues. What was your biggest accomplishment you feel in Congress? Um, you know, I, I think that the thing that, uh, it's not done yet. That's, that's what I'm. The, the best thing I did was come across a good idea, um, mm. but that idea isn't implemented yet, and it's what I'm keeping on doing post Congress. It's not. It's not like I came up with the idea. It's just I came across the idea. In other words, I found the idea along with other people who found the idea, which is 
a very uh, muscular way to deal with climate change that also creates incredible free enterprise opportunities um, to expand wells and create jobs. Um, and that's um, to do a carbon tax um, that's uh, paired with a reduction in uh, say payroll taxes or a dividend to the money back either way. But uh, the payroll tax reduction is really attractive, especially if you're on the left, because it's an opportunity to address income inequality while you're addressing climate change, you get a twofer. And if you're a Jack Kemp Republican, like I was just saying, you actually do care about poor people and you do care about the fact that the FICA tax, the, the payroll tax is the most regressive tax we got. It really hits poor people. If you work at McDonald's as a second job, mm. you're paying 12.4% on every dollar you make at that McDonald's. Wow. It's a whopping tax rate. Um, and so you reduce that, you put on a carbon tax. Congressional Budget Office says the bottom 70% do better. Mm. And you get a muscular way to get China in on climate action not by moral signaling and telling them, oh, why aren't we so good here in America to do this and you should follow our lead? No, 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 no. We put on a tax on their stuff coming in here. They object in the World Trade Organization. We think they lose that case. And after they've lost, they find it in their interest to do the same thing in China. And then their goods would come in here without paying our carbon tax because they already paid it at home. And so then you got the whole world following our lead um, and you're really solving climate change, but you're also addressing income inequality. Um, so it's an idea, like I say, it's not original to me. In fact, if some of your listeners are progressives and they're thinking, gee, that's sounding so familiar. And, and maybe they're even older progressives are thinking, gee, Mani, that sounds familiar. How's that English? That guy with all those terrible ratings we just heard. Um, uh, sounding that way. Well, it's because it's the exact same thing that Al Gore has been for, for about 30 years. And so uh, I believe, and this is where I'm again, that Jack Kemp kind of guy that says, we can bring America together and lead the world to a solution. If, if I can agree with Al Gore on this, then um, can't we bring America together? I mean, a guy with those ratings I just gave you, who says he came across this idea, turns out is also Al Gore's idea, exactly the same thing. Then, Congress, oh, go ahead, Congress. Why not do it, you know? And oh, by the way, it's what almost every economist would tell you to do. In fact, you know, in this age of overstatement, that sounds like an overstatement, but honest to goodness, you go look for an economist who wouldn't say that is the first and most obvious thing to do. And you will look a long, long time because, mm. Almost all economists say that's the most obvious thing to do is just price in the negative effects of burning fossil fuels through a pricing mechanism, make it border adjustable. If you're conservative, you insist on it being revenue neutral. In other words, cut taxes somewhere else or, or dividend the money back. But like I say, if you're a progressive and you're interested in income inequality, that's a great way to address that. Congressman Bob Inglis here on Fire Breathing Rob. Congressman, let's talk about this to start into climate change. Now, you were a climate denier. Now you're a climate believer. I did watch a video while preparing for the interview that you did with your son, uh, speaking about Joe Biden, but mainly about climate change in general. Did your son have that influence on you that made you change belief systems on climate change? Or was it something that you saw or did in general? How did that all change? Um, it was love that made me change. I started with my son and, uh, yeah, I mean, so it's like this, you know, for six years, I said that climate change was nonsense. I didn't know anything about it except that Al Gore was for it. That was my first six years in Congress. I, I admit that's pretty ignorant, but that's the way it was. And then I was out of Congress six years doing commercial real estate law again in Greenville, South Carolina, had the opportunity to run for Congress again, the very same seat in 2004 and my son, the eldest of our five kids, had just turned 18 that year, so he's voting for the first time. And he uh, came to me and said, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're gonna clean up your act on the environment. Um, and so um, that was step one of a three-step metamorphosis. Step two was going to Antarctica, seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings. Yeah. Step three was being inspired by the faith of an Aussie climate scientist 
who I was snorkeling with the Great Barrier Reef, and he's showing me the glories of the reef, but also the challenge of coral bleaching. And I could see that he and I shared a worldview. And no words have been spoken about faith, but I could tell that we shared a worldview. Um, you know, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. And so uh, Scott was preaching the gospel just without any words. Later, we had a chance to talk, and he told me about conservation changes he was making in his life in order to love God and love people. And I got right inspired. I want to be like Scott, loving God and loving people. So I came home and introduced the Raise Wages Cut Carbon Act of 2009. Um, note to self, do not introduce carbon tax in midst of great recession. When you represent perhaps the reddest district in the reddest state of the nation, it will not go well for you. And it didn't go well at all. I got tossed out of Congress. Uh, after 12 years in Congress, I got in a Republican runoff, I got 29% of the vote. And the other guy got the other uh, 71 percent of the vote so uh, a rather spectacular face plant <laughs> so and ever since then that's what i've been out to do is to convince conservatives that of the value of what i found in those uh, in in that search for a solution to climate change that there's a way to fix this that actually improves the economy um and that improves the air um and so um that's what I've been about ever since. Like I said earlier, it's, it's the idea I came across. It's not finished yet. I hope from a position outside of Congress, actually, to, uh, to help get it done. Well, we should hit all these issues at once with infrastructure and environmental issues because they all kind of groove together. Do you agree with that, Congressman? Um, well, I, I'm surprised we haven't heard more about more flints um, yeah. because... It's, I just got to believe that, I mean, you, you would expect this to be the case, that if you go back to the, like the 1920s or 1930s and they're using lead pipes and they're, you got to assume that there is an old infrastructure in a lot of our cities and towns that's really sort of in bad shape, you know? I mean, you got to be really on top of a plan of replacing that stuff and uh, fixing it up, right? And so I, I'm really actually sort of surprised we haven't heard more, more and more flints um, because, and of course I know it wasn't just the pipes in their case, it had to do with the water source and some things like, and, 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 and bad decisions there. But, but yeah, around cities, I, I just, I gotta believe, you know, you, you put something in the ground like a water line, sewer line, hmm. and a tree grows by it. Well, what happens to the sidewalk where the tree is growing? Well, answer, sidewalk buckles. And you know, now you don't have a smooth sidewalk. What do you think happened to the pipes underneath there? <laughs> and, okay. and now then, is the sewer pipe a little bit broken? And is the water pipe a little bit broken? And it, are those two waters mingling? <laughs> <laughs> and probably you don't want to mingle those two waters. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's just, that's just a reality of where we are. And so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of that uh, needs to be attended to, um, and it's pretty expensive. Is it because that money is so far in politics that these politicians are getting paid off by big oil, uh, fossil fuel companies in general, that none of this environmental legislation is being pushed through because too many politicians rather are being paid off and that there, if there was money that was taken out of po politics, public financing of elections, that these issues would be agreed upon. Then we move to the center, as you said, America with the, the moderate America and people will put these politicians rather will get things done and we can accomplish great things for this country and really rebuild the country because it needs a lot of rebuilding. Yeah, and I think here's where, uh, here's another, I said earlier that one of your challenges on the left would be that you you live in a center-right country, and so okay. therefore you're trying to do more than a lot of people want to do. Another challenge you've got is you've got you've got a federalistic system here that is probably somewhat frustrating to the left because the, those those pipes and that I was just talking about, um, the country is set up for the local government to handle those pipes. Um, and so for a conservative like me, you're okay with that. Um, 
But if you're a progressive, you're frustrated with that because you're like, well, why can't we fix the water lines in Flint? Well, you can. It's just that if you appropriate money for Flint's water lines, there are 434 other members of the U.S. House who would like money for their water lines in their district. And now you got a water bill that is really expensive and that you're administering from Washington, D.C., but the pipes and the tree that broke the water line and the sewer pipe and pushed up the sidewalk, it's in a locale. It's in a local city or town. And getting the money down to them, well, it's the way the country views it is that's a pretty inefficient way to do it. But if you're on the left, you want to just get it all done at once, right? And that's so it's frustrating, I'm sure, to the left. Um, but that's why at republician.org, when we're talking about climate, we think climate is a unique and obligation of the federal government. It's not an obligation of the local or state government. It is the obligation of the federal government because emissions anywhere are climate change everywhere. So in that case, it must be federal action because no state, no locality can get China in on this thing. Only the federal government can. And the federal government can do it by making that carbon tax payable at the border if you're coming in from a country with a product that doesn't have the same carbon tax. Mm -hmm. That is a muscular way to deal with that and to get the whole world in. But if you're in South Carolina, let's say, or in Flint, Michigan, and you want to also solve climate change, well, the only way to do it is through your federal representatives uh, because you can morally signal and say, well, we're not going to have any natural gas being burned here in our city. Well, fine. How are you going to get China in on that? Are you going to expect them to follow your moral example? Well, that's sweet, but uh, so far they're not following our moral example on, uh, on treating their people right. You know, they, they have a horrible human rights uh, system there. Yes, we should rejoin Paris. And I'm very glad for President Biden doing that. Um, it was uh, just a a, a crazy place for America to be sniveling on the mm -hmm. sidelines saying that it wasn't fair to us. I mean, is that what, is that what a, the country that <laughs> says it's the leader of the world does snivels on the sidelines? I don't think so. I don't think that was making America great again. I think it was making America hide or something. So, um, um, so I'm glad that rejoining Paris, rejoining Paris, um, and uh, now we got to admit, though, that it's not, it establishes a will, but not a way. Yeah. So it's good to establish a will. You know, if I have some problem in my life, the first thing to do is to say, okay, I, I, I wish to change this. I have a will to change this. And now I got to find a way. So Paris is the wish and the will. Now we got to find a way. And the way I, I think would be America acting in such a way it makes it in the interest of the whole world to follow our lead. Um, and uh, that, that would be through that carbon pricing uh, mechanism, a carbon tax that's applied at the borders. I see what you're saying with the carbon tax. I agree with that 100%. We bring up the new Green New Deal. I know you don't probably agree with this, but I'm not going to put words in your mouth before you explain yourself. But, you know, you talked about what happened in Flint, and we talk about what's going on in the coronavirus, where a lot of people are out of work right now. If we do, and obviously needing these big fundamental changes, if we do some sort of Green New Deal, putting all these people back to work, sort of like a WPA from FDR, we could create jobs, build that infrastructure in America uh, we talk about electric cars. We need electric, um, you know, gas stations that do uh, have electric places where these cars can charge. And also we can build that infrastructure along with doing good things for the environment. Do you feel like the Democrats and the progressives in general frame the Green New Deal wrong? And that's why a lot of Republicans are against it. So in the case of the Green New Deal, what I'd say to you is, I think that the the, the, the challenge for the left is that they have a handy boogeyman in corporations. Mm. You know, you know uh, uh, Ronald Reagan used to say government, and it sounded like a cuss word. Um, and so to hear AOC say corporation, 
is almost like a cuss word, you know? I mean, and so, oh, it, it does good things on the left. People go, oh, yeah, we hate them. We hate the corporations. Oh, yeah, 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 terrible corporations. Um, just like Reagan did it on the right where, oh, government, government, government. We hate government, government, government. Uh, and so, so the result is that uh, most people realize that innovation comes from those corporations. Um, and I remember early in the coronavirus being on a call with some philanthropists looking to what they could do. And they were, it's a curious call where somebody was asked the question, well, what, what should we, the, the people on the call that were in philanthropy, uh, what should we be doing? And this expert who's, uh, I guess, an epidemiologist or something, mm -hmm. he said, well, to tell you the truth, what we need right now is people who can make stuff like mask, like protective gear. <laughs> and it's like, well, oh yeah, we need people who can make stuff. And I think most people in America realize that's what you need. People who can make stuff. Um, you know, when you need a mask, you need a mask. When you need electricity, you need electricity and you got to make it somehow. And so this whole idea that somehow we're going to cuss the corporations who are making the mask and protective gear and creating electricity for us, well, it, it just doesn't fly with most people. Um, or I shouldn't say with most people, it doesn't fly with a clear majority of Americans. It does fly with some um, who, and, and some strong, strong-willed people who are strongly voiced um, and they show up and they are very much for the, what, uh, you know, AOC's uh, Tea Party of the Left. Um, but I do have said to her directly in her district on the Chris Hayes show one time is I think I'm witnessing here the creation of the Tea Party of the Left. Um, now, I, I think that the Tea Party of the Left, though, and the Green New Deal and, and what AOC is doing is going to mature more rapidly than the Tea Party of the Right. Because again, back to what we said at the outset, Tea Party of the Right was successful in getting nothing done. They didn't want anything done. <laughs> so that's easy to count success. But I think that the nature of people of the left is to want to accomplish stuff through government. So I, I would expect the AOC sort of movement to mature more quickly than the Tea Party of the Right matured. But don't you strive as a person that's a congressman or in AOC's case as a congresswoman, you always push, you know, whether it's all the way to the right or all the way to the left to get to that, say, I want a Green New Deal. We know that you're not going to get that, but you're, they're going to move you all the way from the left and move you a little bit to the center. So you are getting at least some of what you want. Whereas you, if you start at the middle, this is what I was saying with Joe Biden and the Democrats, they always start in the middle and the Republicans pull them to the right. And it may, maybe you disagree with that, but that's what I see as a progressive is, I'm fine with not getting full on Medicare for all. I'm fine with not getting a full on Green New Deal. But what the Democrats do is they always negotiate from the center right, and then they get pulled farther toward the right. And that's why we never get anything as far as a left movement or any kind of left full-on policies. Do you disagree with that? What do you think about that, Congressman? Um, well, I, I guess there is some wisdom in going in, you know, starting your, uh, start, starting your case with what you mostly want. But um, actually, uh, I think that, you know, and I got to discount what I'm saying because I was Republicans for Biden, you know, uh, but I think that uh, Joe Biden has a chance for, to be a very effective president uh, because of what you just described. In other words, that he, he realizes that politics is the art of the possible, that he doesn't get exactly the orange juice that he wants. Right. He gets some kind of fruit drink. Um and those charging stations, he can get that in infrastructure package. There are Republicans that will vote for that. Um, and uh, he can do a lot of other stuff. Um, yeah. That I think that if you had your choice, if, if Bernie had been elected to the presidency, I think Bernie would get about nothing done in the U.S. Congress. It's just about zero um, because yeah. there'd be an immediate reaction against him. Um, and it would be strong. And it would be impregnable um, by Bernie. But Joe, 
Joe Biden can start in this place of saying, listen, I want to heal the country. I want to bring us together. I know the Senate. I know these people. Mm -hmm. Let me be a nice LBJ master of the Senate. You don't want to be like LBJ was. He was a nasty human being, apparently. If you read the Caro book about master of the Senate, he's a nasty fellow, especially to his wife. Uh, but uh, hopefully Joe could be a nice LBJ master of the Senate. And so that's, that's what I'm hoping for, a very effective presidency. In your organization of Republican.org, are you targeting more of these younger kids? Are you seeing that they're not way to the right Trump supporters, that they can be moderate Republicans and they can also get things done if they were, you know, for some reason down the road elected to Congress or the Senate in general? Yeah, uh, we, we find uh, young conservatives are with us. Young people of faith are with us. Right. Their parents and their grandparents are harder for us. Mm. But we're, we're after all the above. Uh, we want to, at republican.org, we're conservatives reaching conservatives on climate change. We use the language of conservatism. You, you'll hear from us high-octane Milton Friedman conservatism. And, um, you know, uh, that's, uh, that works with those young people, the, their, their parents and their grandparents. But yes, uh, young people are... Young conservatives are, 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 it's not an issue position for young people. Yeah. It's a value proposition. It's part of who they are is that they want to deal with climate change. It's, it's not like a, oh yeah, I favor, you know, a 10 cent tax on such and so. No, no, it's not like that. It's a value for them. And so that's shared across uh, the political spectrum among young people. Let's end with this as a little bit of hope. As far as, you know, the country's in peril right now with the virus and the loss of jobs, people going homeless, you were with Republicans for Biden. How do you feel like Joe Biden can unite the country? I yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, I think we've got a shot uh, at uh, reuniting the country. And it's because I think Joe Biden uh, has been given experiences in life that have etched him with empathy. And that's, that's what's going to help us most. I mean, if you, uh, you know, compared to Donald Trump, who really, I just wonder whether he knows what empathy is. Um, uh, I mean, really, I, I think that he may be mentally ill and, and not able to identify with other people. Um, but Joe Biden, you know, has had these experiences in life where um, it's just etched him with ep empathy. So, um, but it's also what we're asking, I'm, I, people like me are asking a great deal of Joe Biden. I'm basically asking Joe to be completely Christ-like and turn the other cheek. So when the Republicans in the Senate do something nasty to him or say something nasty about him, it's gonna be really hard, but Joe just has to turn the other cheek. But do you understand okay, where somebody like me, sorry to interrupt you, Congressman, but somebody like me is coming from when we saw you were in that Congress during the Obama years for a partial, of, um, partial amount of time, excuse me, uh, during that time. Barack Obama consistently said, I want to work with the Republicans. I want to be bipartisan. And they basically, and we heard Mitch McConnell the first night when Barack Obama was elected say, we want Barack Obama to be a one-term president. So yep. what is the difference here when we're seeing the same thing with Joe Biden coming in and his press sec secretary saying yesterday that we, he wants to be bipartisan also? I just feel like it's the Obama years repeating itself. Well, there's a couple of differences. One is uh, Barack Obama was cursed by his own success. He brought in a, a wave election mm -hmm. and that gave people like Nancy Pelosi the idea, let's cram it down now while we've got the power. Yeah. Joe's uh, win is a much humbler victory. Uh, so that's one key difference. Another key difference, and this is, I don't like what I'm about to say, but it's true, is that uh, Joe Biden is an old white guy um, who's a labor union Democrat. Barack Obama was a black guy who brought the opportunity to use the accelerant of race and throw it on the fire that was already going. And that became a wildfire. So 
the fact that Joe's an old white guy, um, you know, may actually help us. I mean, it should not be that way. It should not be that there was that reaction against uh, Barack Obama. It's terrible. It's also true that it may not happen here. That there, you, you know, now you notice that some on the right are trying to say, oh, that's why Kamala Harris, yeah. really the secret plan here is that she's going to take over for Joe Biden and then is, we're going to become socialist. Um, you know, and so that, uh, that's an attempt to use that accelerant and throw it on that fire and get it going hotter. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to work. And so I think that's why there's a difference here. And, um, and, and so, uh, and, and I think there's also a lesson that's been learned um, in, in the end of the Trump regime that ended with an armed insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. And uh, I think that that's waked a lot of people up to the reality that, hey, you know what? We were playing with fire mm -hmm. um, and you cannot control fire. Um, and so let's turn away from that. Um, and so for all those reasons, I think this can be different. I, I hope you're right. So as we end the interview, can you tell the viewers where they can find more about you and the organization Republican? Yes, yeah, come to see us, republicen.org. It's EN for energy, environment, entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, if you're not, if you're not uh, center right or right, um, but you got a cousin who is, Send them to us because we we want to help make visible and audible people on the right who care about climate change. So it's republicen.org. Congressman, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Great to be with you, Rob. Thanks for having me. Yeah.